Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Battling and Beating Cancer. I'm Scott Seaman, a 12-year survivor of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the co-founder of the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation. Charlene is on assignment tonight, uh, but we're going to continue with our mission of informing you about lymphoma, leukemia, myeloma, and introducing you to some of the best doctors in the business dealing with blood cancer here tonight on Battling and Beating Cancer. Uh, Can TV reaches about a million viewers right here in Chicago, and this is our second to the last show for the season. And so I thought it was an appropriate time to uh, thank Can TV. And it starts at the top with Barbara and Tiffany and Sylvia and Steve, who are all just fabulous. And what an important service it is for organizations and groups to get out and be able to talk to you and individuals to be able to express views to you here on TV. It's something that's a fundamentally important thing and uh, we've enjoyed uh, this show and we are uh, in the process of preparing one heck of a grand finale for the season. Uh, we're fortunate that we're one of the top rated shows on Can TV, and we thank you for that and for tuning in and we hope that you find this to be informative and also find out that you know cancer although those words are very scary that when you get diagnosed or a friend or a family member gets diagnosed and since one out of two men and more than one out of three women in America will hear those scary words you have cancer at some point in your life it's important that you know that there are people you can turn to their organizations like the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation and there are terrific doctors right here in Chicago and we're very fortunate you don't have to travel the globe because you have wonderful choices particularly if you have blood cancer uh, so let's just talk a moment about Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation. You know we're a 501c3 nonprofit, and our mission is to cure lymphoma, leukemia, and myeloma. And the way that we do that is by raising awareness, by educating people, and by helping to raise money for research because it's that research that results in more effective treatments and less toxic treatments and really is the ticket to all of our long-term uh, survival. And we fund and support those great institutions right here in Chicago like the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, which we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you need information, or if you want to join us on the superhighway to curing cancer, www.chicagobloodcancer.org is the website, and the phone number is 888-792-9992. And we've been talking over this series about how blood cancer research is the superhighway to curing cancer, and we've gotten some emails and some calls for people to uh, just expand upon that and explain why that is a little bit. And in a couple moments, our special guest, uh, Dr. Andy Evans, will uh, get a chance to talk about that in a much more enlightened way. But basically, if you look at the evidence of history, virtually every major breakthrough in cancer research has come through the blood cancers, lymphomas and leukemias, the first chemotherapy, the first radiation, multiple chemotherapy regimens, stem cell transplantation, monoclonal antibodies. We've talked about rituxan, for example, which is that smart chemo, if you will, and a lot of doctors don't like to call it chemo because it scares people, but it's that chemical that attaches to proteins on the cell and harnesses a, an immune response. And then if that doesn't do the job, radioimmunotherapies, which you take that monoclonal antibody and you attach a radioactive element to it that not only attaches to the cell and zaps that cell. So, so many treatments have been developed for uh, not only lymphoma and leukemia and myeloma from blood cancer research, but for other cancers as well. Tamoxifen, for example, resulted from uh, lymphoma research, although it didn't help for lymphoma, it's helped for some forms of breast cancer. And uh, the rituxan that we talked about, uh, when they were doing clinical studies on that, they found that people who had rheumatoid arthritis were feeling a lot better. And so two or three years ago, the FDA actually approved rituxan for treatment. And the other, so not only is there the evidence of history, if you get behind it a little bit, you say, well, why is it that blood cancer research has been the biggest bang for our research dollars? Well, for one thing, the blood's accessible, so you can get at it. But for another thing, when you're talking about lymphomas, uh, and even some leukemias, you're talking about cancer of the immune system, 
of the lymphocytes, which are part of your uh, blood cells that fight infection. And we all know the importance of the immune system because lots of people can be exposed to the same virus or bacteria or toxic uh, substance. Some people get cancer, some people don't. Part of the answer to that is in the immune system. And the same is true for inflammation which plays a role in cancer and the immune system plays a role in inflammation so it all comes together and uh, yes we're biased because we're Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation but if you have a particular cancer that's your enemy because you or somebody has like breast cancer or colon cancer by all means support that type of research and their synergy but overall the biggest bang for our research dollar has been through blood cancer research and so uh, we, we could talk more about that but I'm really anxious to get on with our special guest Dr. Andy Evans and he is the Associate Professor of Medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine and he's a clinician and researcher at the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center of Northwestern University and he's one of these great doctors that we talk about and he's a little bit younger than some of the other doctors that we've had but he's already had a stellar career because not only does he treat patients but we're going to talk about some of the research that he's doing and I had the occasion to meet Dr. Evans for the first time when I int uh, attended the International uh, Lymphoma Symposium that was held here in Chicago and what a great uh, uh, forum you put together in terms of the, the subjects and the materials that were covered and the international specialists from all around the world and of course featuring heavily the great minds that we have here in Chicago. So Dr. Evans, welcome to Battling Thank you. Cancer. Thank you for having me. Well, I've got to tell you, we talk a lot about research and, and I want to really cover two main things with you. I want to talk about Burkitt's lymphoma uh, in particular and uh, research and some of the projects that you've got going on because it sort of brings all of the things that we've been talking about, research, collaboration, clinical research, all together. So if we could just start out by talking about Burkitt's and, and what it is. Sure. As I think one of your prior guests and one of my colleagues, Dr. Leo Gordon, talked about, Burkitt's lymphoma is one of the many different subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And as I as I'm sure Dr. Gordon talked about, that's actually one of the first challenging aspects is to make sure you have which type of lymphoma because many cancers, when you diagnose it, whether it's breast cancer or colon cancer, it's one or two types. But non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, believe it or not, there's almost 60 different types. And part of that is, is good. It, it can be complicating to a patient. I thought it was one disease and it's 60 possible, but there's a treatment for all 60. And part of the reason we, there are so many types is our science. Over the last multiple decades, especially over the last 10 years, is exactly as you mentioned, we're learning not only what's on the cell surface, we're a ton of research learning about inside the cancer cells. In other words, their DNA. Mm -hmm. And just like our own cells in our body have DNA, cancer cells have DNA. That's what keeps them alive. So a lot of our research has focused not only on using that to diagnose the different types, but then exactly as you called it a smart therapy, it, it's what it is, it's targeted therapy. Mm -hmm. Chemotherapy is still important and helpful, but it's kind of nonspecific, it just kills everything in the body. Yeah. Where these targeted therapies like rituximab, and a lot of our research, it's trying to go right to the lymphoma cell. Yeah, and, and kill since, it in that fashion. Since when I was diagnosed 12 years ago, I think uh, we were talking about 30 types of non-Hodgkin. Now we're at 60 or 61 types, and probably in a few years we'll be at more. And, and yes, it causes some confusion, but we're really progressing in the treatment and the research from being able to say, well, it's non-Hodgkin, to say it's a particular type, to be able to ultimately say that for each individual person, we're going to be able to see what their cancer cells are and what specific treatment does the best job in terms of killing those cells and leaving the rest of their cells alone. Absolutely, and as you can imagine, we wouldn't want to design a treatment just to treat all 60. Each one of these, we try to target to study, and our treatments are targeted to that one specific subtype, obviously targeting the exact cell. And so, coming back to your original question, Burkitt's lymphoma is one of the 60. Interestingly, in adults at least, it's one of the rarest. It actually is less than 1% of all adults diagnosed in the U.S., and it's about 66,000 every year in the United States. 66,000 are diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's, and less than 1% of that is Burkitt's lymphoma. And it's, it's really been, I think, one of the success stories in terms of treatment that we can get into in a little bit. 
And it, just if you remember, Dr. Gordon was talking about aggressive and non-aggressive lymphomas, and Burkitt's is a, an aggressive form of B lymphoma, typically. Right? You're absolutely right. Moreover, it's probably one of the most aggressive, not just lymphomas. I, I think many people would agree it's one of the most aggressive cancers known to man. In fact, one of the teaching points that we teach residents and, and fellows is it has what we call a doubling time, meaning it can literally double every 24 hours. And most cancers don't spread or grow that fast, but it, Burkitt's can do that. It hits this very rapid cell cycle, and so it's, it's definitely a very aggressive. But as, as I'll tell patients often, the, the bigger they are, the faster they grow, the, the faster they can fall. And so, because that's how actually chemotherapy is designed for all cancers, generally speaking, it kills cells that grow fast. Well, Burkitt's grows very fast, and it took us a little while to figure out exactly how to treat it, but we've gotten pretty good at it. And you, that's sort of the initial reaction I had. I had a large diffused B cell, and I was told it's aggressive, and I said, oh, no, that's bad. And it was in the sense it was aggressive, and I needed immediate treatment. But the good news is it was potentially curable. Is absolutely. The same with, with Burkitt's? It absolutely is. You're right. And so we'll tell patients, yes, not only is it treatable, meaning give a treatment, goes away, the goal of treating that and diffuse large B cells to cure it, obviously go away, never come back. And that's absolutely our primary goal. And it's also uh, one of the more common forms of lymphoma in children, isn't it? It is. It is. So in, even, the, it, even though in adults it's less than 1%, lymphoma as a whole is less common in children. Mm -hmm. But when you look at lymphoma in children, Burkitt's is actually one of the more common. And quite frankly, that's in adults, actually, we learned how to treat it based on pediatric research. Mm -hmm. They really adopted it in the 1980s and 1990s because quite, quite honestly, we weren't using the right combination and we weren't using the right cocktail, so to speak. And we learned in pediatrics because it grows so fast. So if you use the same treatment to treat diffuse large B cell for Burkitt's, mm -hmm. it grows, it's too fast growing. So what they realized, all right, this is so fast growing, this is through clinical research, which I think we're gonna talk about later, we have to stack it, make it more intense, bring it closer together, and by intensifying the therapy, which was first done in pediatrics, literally the cure rate doubled, not overnight, but over a couple months through, through a couple really pivotal clinical research studies in the 1990s, the cure rate doubled. And then obviously we're, we're continuing to build on that success. And so what is the, the overall cure rate? Well, it depends. So a lot of it uh, depends on age. Lawyers are, and doctors are the same. We usually you have to. It depends. Well, it's, it's true. Very complicated. Well, it, it is, and you don't want to. Not exactly like lawyers, but we have to. We it's partly, they are better than lawyers. Yes, it's partly being honest. They do something constructive. Yes, yes. Well, I won't comment on that, but yeah, we try, and so it it, it depends. But I th what I would say is because it's such intense therapy, as you can imagine, as you get older, it's harder to tolerate. But what I would say is less than age 40 or 50, um, the general cure rate is probably about 70%. You hate to put a number on something right. because every patient is different. If you catch it in an early stage, meaning we call it stage one in one spot, the cure rate's upwards of 90%. For more advanced stages in multiple areas, which is more common in lymphoma because mm -hmm. we have lymph nodes all throughout the body, cure rate's closer to 60 to 70%. And so, which is good and has gotten better, but obviously we're not stopping there. We want to keep going. We want to actually we want to put ourselves out of business. We want to go as close to 100% as possible. Absolutely, absolutely. And 